It's time to ignite your soul and unlock your full potential. Join us on Beneath the Helmet, the podcast exploring firefighters' health and wellness. Hosted by retired fire chief Arjuna George, our podcast is the perfect place to start your journey towards becoming the best version of yourself. So come on, let's join the conversation and find out what sets your soul on fire. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is season two, Beneath the Helmet, another amazing episode. Today, I got a chance to sit down with somebody who I consider to be uh, an amazing leader, somebody who's really passionate about the human aspect of leadership in the fire service, especially. Today, I got a chance to sit down and have a real powerful conversation with Benjamin Martin. Uh, I've been hoping to have him on the show for a while now, and uh, he was generous enough to, to share his time with us. And so today, while you're listening, you might want to grab a pen and paper because there's loads of powerful nuggets in here. Uh, there's a few moments that I was, when I was interviewing him, that I was kind of blown away myself of kind of the aspects and and just the perspective that he sees on leadership, especially in the fire service. And, and a lot of it resonates deeply with me, uh, especially the human aspect of leadership and how we can be better listeners, better communicators, more compassionate. Uh, so yeah, the, the whole conversations of, you know, around leadership in the fire service. So this is definitely one not to miss. You might want to save this one, share it with your friends, because there's a lot of powerful takeaways in this episode. So until next time, sit back, grab that pen and paper, and uh, thanks for listening. Until next time, stay well. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Got a very special guest on the show. Uh, we've been chatting back and forth for a few months now, and we finally get a chance to sit down. I got the pleasure to sit down with Benjamin Martin today, uh, one of America's and actually North America's um, leadership experts in the, in the fire service world and and now a doctor I hear. So congratulations. Well, thank you. And thanks for having me on. Awesome. So welcome to the show. And I'm uh, really looking forward to this conversation. And uh, I actually took one of your intoxicated leadership sessions in Canada um, a number of years ago. But, oh, great. Uh, oh, yeah, very cool. Lo loved all your, all your stuff you're sharing and uh, kind of the path that you're on right now. So kudos to you and the, your kind of your vision of how you want to see the fire service adapt and, and improve. So, so uh, Benjamin, tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of where you grew up and how you got into the fire service and maybe how you got to where you are today in your position. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, you know, keeping at a, a 30,000 foot view, so we're not here for the hour. Um, I'm, I'm a product of uh, a two parent home. I, I think that matters, right? I was fortunate enough to have my dad uh, with me till about three years ago. And uh, it's one of those things, just like leadership, you know, the older I get, the more I have a chance to be a father myself, the more I realize just how much he and my mom had figured out whether I understood it at the time, they just keep getting smarter, even though they're not necessarily still learning anything. Um, I started right when I was in college volunteering, it fell in love with it. And then when I found out they pay me for it full time, I ended up packing up everything and moving. Uh, so I've lived in Virginia my whole life, but I've, I've been around the state. And I've been within the same department, which is now Henrico Fire, uh, which is one of the largest in the state. And uh, I started with them in 2005. So I've got, uh, I count my volunteer experience just over 20 years. Um, hybrid wise, like I love what I do, but I also love learning. So I'm, I'm probably one of the rarities that I'll take as many forceful entry classes as I can. And I also have some degrees. And I, I think that's worth mentioning, not because I don't think you can I don't think you need degrees to do this job, but I definitely think it's a form of training that opens your eyes to some stuff. So I've got, uh, I got a degree in fire science and then I got a little bit curious about like the business side. So then I went and got a master's in public administration. So then I got a little bit more curious about people. I was really like, I was a young leader. I was running into a lot of conflict because I was trying to treat people the way I want to be treated, which was a lot of information, a lot of opportunity, like all out effort and some people just wanted to show up and do their job and go home. And I just couldn't understand that. And so I had a lot of problems relating to people um, and then had some some failures pretty early on, like pretty significant failures, um, like including having to be transferred from a firehouse because nobody wanted to work with me. And it was one of those things where it was like, you know, let me love you. Like, I just want to, I just want to help and be the lieutenant or the captain for you guys that I wanted when I was coming up. But I just realized that I don't know nearly enough about this stuff. And unfortunately, you know, the fire service here in North America is still playing catch up and we're not getting people 
training before they get the opportunity. So it's kind of like the dog chasing the car and then catching it. It's like, now what? Like, this is a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. It's not necessarily, it was fun to bark at it, but now I have it. Now what am I going to do with it? And so that's kind of uh, where you are. So I did just, you know, to your point, finished up a PhD in industrial psychology, which is pretty much just the workforce at work. Like, why do they do what they do? It has a lot to do with engagement, motivation. It could have stuff to which recruitment and retention implications as well. So it's just been a fun five years of deep diving about anywhere from neuroscience to general psychology to social psychology is. And it's been fascinating to, to see how people's narrative about who they are and what they do and the people they do with, how that changes when they're by themselves, when they're with the right leader, when they're with the wrong leader, when they're with the group, right or wrong. And then obviously how organizational culture and climate and then systems, how all of these things are interacting to, to kind of give you the result you get. And so often we fail to look at things, I think, holistically. And we try to figure out a lot of times, and usually, you know, in the name of accountability, we'll pin it on a person or two. And I think a lot of times it's the organization first and then the employee. And so my rallying cries of lately over the last year has really been forcing our organization to give the employee the benefit of the doubt and really looking up to shore up. And there's plenty of places, and no one's fault, it's just kind of how it's played out over, you know, several decades of just change. And we've not been able to keep up with all of our processes and systems. And so we're setting our people up to be on different pages. And that's not fair to them. So once we have that piece fixed, then, then we can have a conversation about holding people accountable again. And that's not to say we don't hold people accountable. There are clear violations, but it is to say that we try to get them the benefit of the doubt. So I couldn't agree more. That, couldn't agree more. And uh, I guess the only thing I have to add is I've got a 10 and 12 year old that also be uh, around at home as Ayla and Camille. I'm mean, unfortunate. They're a pretty incredible one. Krista, and that's the family unit. Beautiful. Beautiful. So if you had to boil it down to one nugget that you walked away in your PhD journey about people, what would that one nugget be? Relationships. Mm. Like we have, like biologically, we have such a strong programming to belong. Uh, it's we want to do things we enjoy with people we enjoy doing it with. And that's not just like people that look like us. That's people who think like us, who have similar beliefs. And I think think I knew that, you know, we, we've got a lot of inclusive initiatives going on, but I don't think we have begun to crack the shell of, of what it means to, to show up and try to create an environment where we get the most out of people because they really feel like they belong and a, a term like psychological safety where they belong and they feel safe around the people that they're with, which is crazy for me to think about if you're going to talk about fire service, like, you know, I'm, I'm safe on the fire ground with these people, but I'm not safe in the firehouse with them. And like, that's exactly what I'm saying. And if you've ever been fear of retaliation for saying something or trying to give somebody feedback and they won't hear you. Like we commit a lot of resources in our brain to thinking about, is it safe for me to do or say this thing? And I don't think we leverage relationships in a way that promotes positive retention of the workforce. And I think we fail to see sometimes that when we do try to make efforts to retention, it also creates a ripple effect for our recruitment and vice versa. You know, those things are always housed in tension. So really trying to understand relationships, what the future of the fire service looks like, the generation, that we have, that we're hiring and what they're going to need from leaderships and then try to rally us to, to that pretty much. Um, yeah, I, I call it, uh, if this makes any sense, like I call it leadership 3.0 because when I first got promoted, you need to think about it like a software on your iPhone, you know, you can run so many apps, but at some point you're going to want to install an app and it's going to say, you gotta, you gotta update your software. And so like now you've got apps like compassion and empathy and humility. And it's like, really, do I need these? And like, yeah, yeah, you do. Right. And it's like, so my software won't support it, I've got to update it or get a new phone. And I think that's a lot of times when people are retired because they're like, nope, trade-in value is not worth it. I don't want to learn this new thing. I'm, I'm just done. So they leave. Yeah. Um, but when I started, I genuinely thought, whether it was because I was a bouncer or a bartender or I played rugby or I was just a social person, genuinely thought that if I was really good at my job and I kept people safe, that I'd be well-liked. And maybe, I guess that's what I wanted. At the end of the day, I wanted to be walk into a room. I didn't need to be the most popular person, but I wanted to be liked. I think, I think I can say that a lot. I think that's reasonable. And that didn't last very long at all, which, you know, you all, the audience already knew that. Uh, and then so leadership 2.0 for me very quickly thereafter was like, all right, well, I can't be liked by everybody. Then I want to be respected by everybody. And, uh, I tried that and it didn't work either. That lasted, you know, maybe a few weeks. And there was a large period of time where I didn't necessarily understood like, well, what comes next? And I didn't like, I don't. I try to treat people well and I try to always do more for them, even than I did for myself. But a lot of times when your motivations aren't understood, you know, and I think that happens a lot with passionate type A people, 
mm-hmm. when their passion comes out, it can be overwhelming for somebody to watch. Like, I don't understand why it's so important to understand every aspect of the nozzle or nozzle reaction. And it's like, this is fun to talk about for me. And they're just, it's, yeah, I guess, you know, it's like watching somebody argue against Star Wars and Star Trek. They're like, I don't get it. That's not my thing, but I'm glad you all enjoy doing it. But then like the fire service is, was mine. Mm-hmm. So uh, I went a while and I just, I didn't have a lot of relationships with my peers or my supervisors. It was closing doors on me. I was making mistakes. I wasn't getting the benefit of doubt from anybody. The organization really was, wasn't until I started learning and valuing and incorporating the things I was learning to try to genuinely and authentically improve my relationships where I, I kind of, I think I had figured out what I think 3.0 is and what I would offer to your audiences. I don't think leadership is about being liked by everyone. And it's certainly not being about respected by everyone. But I do think that where we really start to succeed as leaders is that, is that if people like and respect themselves more as a result of our time together. Meaning I don't have to be with you still for you to feel that way. And I think that's the kind of thing that fuels our mentors. I think that's the kind of thing that fuels our coaches, the people that we go to for those roles, our best friends. It's, it's, it's people that we don't necessarily even need to be in constant contact with. But when we are, God, we're so, we're so thankful that they're in our lives and, and we feel better. Like even in moments of despair, seeing a familiar face and seeing somebody that we truly trust and think has our, our backs and our wellness and minds. Like, I think that is something that we're missing. And that's kind of the thing that I'm running around championing. You know? Like we don't have to be best friends with everybody, but you do need a relationship. And if you don't have a relationship, what I mean by that is if you don't have a framework in which sits all of the interactions that you've had with that other person, in a way that you're able to reflect on kind of the patterns and themes that are emerging in those interactions. Like I happen to notice this person that always looks out for me or, and they always know something yeah, like an answer to my question or like those things start to form your expectations. And then when the behavior from that individual or yourself doesn't match the pattern, you don't burn it all down. You don't go like you're a liar. You're like, you're like you can, it forms a basis for I'm sorry. And you being able to actually accept that apology and move on. And so like that piece is really, really important. And if you don't have that baseline, the other piece of it is, how do you know when somebody's off? And I'd hate to think that I didn't have a relationship with somebody enough to know that they were off and I missed something and they ended up hurting themselves or hurting somebody else. And I know we're not going to see everything, but I know we're not going to stand a chance of seeing anything if we don't concern ourselves with, with the baseline of our people. Um, and I know officers who sit on the opposite side of the bay and don't eat with their people. And they think leadership's about separating themselves or like the organization has told them previously, don't do these things with your folks. Or they're afraid to do that because they don't like, I can't be friends with my people. Bullshit. You absolutely can be best friends. That's a whole different story. And it's one that the, uh, the employee that you're supervising is making for you. Like it's, they, they don't do the things that allow you to be friends, then you're not going to be friends because you're going to have to hold them accountable. But if you guys have mutual beliefs and values and enjoy working together, like I'm best friends with a lot of people I've previously supervised, but we always treated that relationship with respect and didn't take it for granted. And that's both of us. That's not me expecting it from him and not being willing to deliver it back. Um, and so that's really kind of probably the single biggest thing I'm trying to help people understand right now is this thing, not just the like force multiplier that relationships can be, but also the importance as those are really the current, I think that operational organization that can open doors, close doors, and not just for you, especially if you're supervising. Does your letter of recommendation mean anything when the fire chief reads it? You know, like there's been times where I have declined writing letters of recommendation for people that I really wanted to support because I knew I was not the person to write that letter. I didn't have the relationship with the individual. In fact, I thought it would work against me. So I had to gracefully decline um, and just figuring all that stuff out. And I think anytime you have leaders that are willing to come in more contact with their people, I think that's when you have more face-to-face communication. I think things get better, at least people feel better. And so just, you know, boiling that, that granular view back up to 30,000 feet, I think is really that relationship piece is, is so important. Yeah. Beautiful. What was your biggest struggle in, in changing your mindset on how to deal with people and, and that? front and mindset of uh being liked being respected to where you are today so i I think if i could say it simply what i might say is i was trying to lead people from where i wanted them to be instead of from where they actually were and so like metaphorically i was if i was at the top of the mountain and you were at the base i was angry that you weren't with me at the top 
And I didn't want to go down to the bottom to get you. I just wanted to coach you from where I was. And that didn't work for people. People resented that. And so like times obviously find out resource for everyone and leaders who are willing to give that more freely to their people, often at expense to their own production. I mean, they got their own roles and jobs. Sometimes it's not always supervising a large group of people. Sometimes it might be administrative. And if you've ever heard, you know, we never see that person anymore. Like we wish it would come out and see the troops and stuff like that's the same. They're saying the same thing. That doesn't mean that other person's work is any less important. It just means that maybe the opportunity is there or maybe they don't realize it's there or wh whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but just humbling myself to realize you don't have this all figured out and you need to let people show up for themselves. You need to let them challenge the perception you have of them. You need to even root for them. Like stop spending any kind of energy looking to prove someone wrong and yourself right. And then flip that around. Like really try to have conversations that prove yourself wrong and them right. And then see where that meets out. And then I think people sense that. Like you become more curious, more genuine, more authentic, less agenda driven. It, I think it just comes across safer and, and easier conversation to have. And doesn't mean I get it right nearly any of the time. But I had I've noticed improvements with my kids, with my wife, with my friends, with my coworkers, peers, bosses. I, I tell people if you've ever walked into a room and felt like no one wanted you there, then I'll walk into a room and if anyone will talk to me, even if it's a shithead who I don't enjoy talking with, who wants to bash the fire service, it's still a privilege. I still consider it a privilege that they're talking to me. And, and that's another sign that I've noticed is when I started getting phone calls to be a witness in some of the professional standards or internal affairs investigations to people that knew I did not necessarily like or agree with their work ethic, I knew that I was doing something right. Um, and that was like the first time it happened. I was like, why, why me? Like, I'm not the one that is going to be in your corner cheering you on. And the reply was, yeah, but you're fair and you're thoughtful. And I may not be perfect in what I've done. And I would like to have somebody in there that give me some feedback to help me. And I was like, wow. And then that went well enough that they told somebody and another person called. And next thing I know, I'm like a regular in there. <laughs> and I, I I think that speaks to like, you need leadership that can be approachable. Um, and then maybe that's the first step in that humility piece is like, come towards me instead of me, like, like I'll come to you as, as you're coming to me. And that's the work that we'll do together and we'll be better for it. But I also work for leaders who refuse to move and everything is on their agenda, their timeline, their reason, their, their how, their why. There's no room for you there. And if you want to leave it better than you found it, that's implying that you need somebody close to you to leave it to. And. And like, those are the little shifts and sometimes big shifts that I've had to make. It's like, how do you create space for people to continually show up, be supported, enjoy the work they're doing, train the dog shit out of them. Like I, I believe in training, like that's not something we're going to negotiate. But at the end of the day, sometimes good enough is good enough. And that needs to be okay. Like we all need to exhale. It can't always be a breath in. Um, and so just whatever, whatever that means to people listening, that's kind of the journey I'm on right now. Excellent. Yeah, I've definitely seen that in myself as well as other firefighters. That expectation is so high because they are so passionate. They are like, like as including myself, uh, so passionate that sometimes that rubs the negative uh, onto somebody, right? So, for myself, uh, yeah, I can I can definitely relate to, you, to how you're experiencing there, uh, for sure. And I know for myself, yeah. I learned through coaching uh, through my coaching program to meet people where they are to listen more, to be more curious and curiosity was not even a word that I really used until my coaching program started. And I was like, curiosity. Okay. I'm curious about, I'm curious about, I'm curious about just sparked amazing conversations. Right. Oh yeah. I mean, you're inviting them into the conversation with questions. And I mean, you can't do that with statements the same way. I mean, you can have rhetorical statements or rhetorical questions, but until they actually contribute and this is where the brain science is really neat. You know, there's a part of your brain that, that hears your thoughts and, and assigns weight and plays your judgment, your perception of your reality. And that's different than the part of your brain that hears your words, like out loud. And so if you've ever said, I don't know why I said that thing out loud, it sounded better in my head. That's exactly what we're talking about here. And so you need a safe space to have people be able to, to be able to say what they're thinking without fear that you're going to think they're an idiot or write them up or, or do any of that stuff. And I think it's definitely one of those things that the, the tighter we hold people, the more we try to squeeze them 
it's like the, the metaphor of sand slipping out of your hands. It's like, it just, they slip out of your hands and, and it's uncomfortable to give them some space because that's not the way we were managed coming up, but that's really what it needs to be. Um, I was watching a kid at the airport the other day, like to talk about a sidebar, two, three year old kid had a leash on his back, which I thought was this a, the randomest thing, but it was one of those backpacks that he could wear. And then when mom wanted to, you know, let him all. Like she could just feed out the backpack and, and she'd hold a leash two, three feet. And I was, wa- I was waiting for my luggage and I was watching this kid. He was having a time of his life getting to explore space where previously, like if she was holding his hand, it would have been constant jerking the kid back. They would not have enjoyed it. He would have gotten upset. But then at the same time, mom got to enjoy that as well because she knew that he had some space, but not too much space. And she was still sizing up things around her and moving her. And him away just in case he wanted to fiddle with something that he shouldn't be messing with. But instead of trying to either, you know, hold her, hold him tight against her chest, prevent him from doing anything, there was some growth happening there. And I think leadership's kind of the same way where I was raised, where I, my hand was held and I was told exactly what to do. And, and I like, maybe that's why we struggled with being curious is why would you, if everything was just going to be regurgitated for you? Yeah. And, or you were going to be told what to do and you couldn't even ask a question. Why would you develop a habit of asking questions? And so now we realize that's not effective and hasn't been effective in a long time. So we're just trying to catch up to that in the fire service. I feel like we're 10 to 15 years behind, honestly, like most of the leading models and theories for leadership, which are all reactionary. Like all those researchers are doing are studying current events. So it, it's happening after the thing has already happened. And then they're trying to identify the themes and, and they're like, I do more studies about like, uh, is this inclusive or is it just one of those things where we think it's causing it? And then by then you've got years that have gone by and now something else has happened. And then, like I said, more easily, like there's not a lot of literature prior 2019 on remote and hybrid workforces, but there was a thing like the pandemic in there. And now you got a different leadership problem you got to solve. So like leadership models and theories are always reactive. They're always trying to identify why we solved the way the problem the way we did but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for the problem that we're now facing or coming down and so just being aware of that and maybe feeds into the curious thing of what don't i know no matter where we are in our careers beautiful so you i I know you're passionate about training how does training not get diluted down and still take time to build relationships take time to uh connect with people instead of, you know, oh, we got, we got trained to do, we don't have time for connection, team building, you know, sitting down over a cup of coffee, got to go throw ladders or whatever that looks like. How do we balance those two? So I think you could probably extend that question out to pretty much every interaction we have, whether, and no matter what the topic is. Right. And I think there's, there's two, maybe three primary ways we, we organize our efforts, but the two that jump out right away are transactional and transformational. And, and I think sometimes you can sub transformational for relational, right? So the goal of this thing that's happening and you can have, sometimes you can have two of those happening at the same time, but most of the time it's one over the other. Like we're here, we're going to train quickly. We're going to get out of here. We're like skill proficiency is all we're here for. That's clearly transactional, right? Like, Hey, I know you guys know how to do this, but I'm going to throw you a challenge. I'm going to throw you a curveball. There's no set time here. Like, like figure it out. Let's try some stuff. Like I'm going to be in here with you. We're going to fail together. We're going to figure out if there's a better way to do this thing. Or somebody saw something at a conference and they want to try it. Let's indulge that. That's more transformational. It's more relational. Um, and people can tell the difference, right? And I think how much you allow them to show up in it usually is what feeds it. So if you have a lot of downtime or you're allowing some conversation, it doesn't necessarily even have anything to do with training. Probably more relational. But at the same time, like communication, we know is always cited as a near miss line of duty calls. So I do want to see people communicate in our drills, even if it's just routine drills. And I want to see when pressure builds up and how they react and how they communicate. And so I'm not saying you should do drills with only or no communication. I think it's important in both places, but you'll feel where the emphasis is, I think is, is probably an easier way to say it. Like if you're there just for the skill versus just for the people. Or which way you're leaning more towards one or the other. That's usually a lot of times. And the people pick up on that, right? And so sometimes I've heard it called training to a standard versus training to a time. Like sometimes they'll get drills and like they'll be done in 20 minutes and they'll attempt like, well, I had an hour scheduled for this. Uh, so we're going to keep going. And the guys are like, no, no, like we're training to a standard. 
you, you told us you wanted to do this thing. We've done this thing. You're trying to hold us to a time, which is it? Cause that's not what we came up here to do. Or do you use the balance of that time for something different, different drill or sitting around talking? And, you know, I like the exhale, inhale aspect of that. You know, we breathe faster and we take more breaths in and out, but I think a lot of times we'll hold our breath when we should be breathing out through things to, to try to reset ourselves. And so just monitoring kind of the organicness and the pH of how that training is going, I think is a lot of feedback to the coach or what exactly is my purpose here? And also having that in mind, like team building's team building. You, you need that. And you'll get some if you're just focused on skills, but you can also get a whole lot without ever picking up a tool. Like there's a whole lot of team building you can do there. So I, I just think a balance of that and a good leader will know when his people need to rest and when they need to press. And then a good leader will know when they need to come together, when there's healthy conflict to be had, or if they're not ready for that. And they should be developing those situations and asking for feedback, you know, so they know whether it's working or not to try to see the outcome that they're hoping to when they design the training in the first place. Change is one of those, the hardest things in the fire service. Mm -hmm. And this is what it's all based around, uh, you know, leadership 3.0 is, is about change. So what strategies do you put in place for your own self to handle change? And what could you share as little nuggets to, to help others maneuver change? Because change is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, there's goods and bads. What's your strategy? So there's a, there's a few things there. One of the first times I ever got to speak was in front of Bobby Halton, which was uh, an incredible experience. And one of the things that I was teaching about was organizational culture. Didn't know nearly what I know now. But I was curious about it. And I, I said something to the fact of, you know, firefighters hate change. I might have used the cliche about, you know, the, when the pain of the change is only outweighed by the pain of staying the same, then we'll change. And he walked up to me afterwards, had some great feedback, but he challenged me on that. And he was like, I, I disagree with you, Benjamin. I don't think, I don't think firefighters resist change. And he goes, none of us are wearing true quarter high boots, wetting our beards down before we go in. Like we have advanced gear, advanced technology, advanced thermal imaging, advanced apparatus, tools, like we are constantly innovating. Now, does innovating have the same negative connotation that change does? And that's, that's an interesting question, right? Like, I think most of us are in the job, want to innovate. Like we want to streamline and make things more efficient. Why, like, why do 10 steps if three accomplishes the task? And if two does it even better, then three and 10, then why not do that at all? So I think sometimes it's how you phrase it, um, trying to prevent that negative reaction from coming up. So we're innovating or I'll say iterating a lot. Like we're trying little things and just like, if people a lot of times can get an, a sense of what you're trying to commit to, or more importantly, what you're asking them to commit to. Hey guys, we're just going to try this thing. We'll see if it works. If it doesn't, no big deal. We're going to go back to what we're doing. That's a whole lot different than, hey, guys, we've got a six month thing we're going to try and I can't, I can't promise you what we're going to do because we don't know the results. And like, there's a whole lot more uncertainty with that, that latter one. So the periods that change plays out obviously has an effect to do it. Your communication efforts to that change, you know, and I can tell you as much as you think you're communicating, you're not like it's the appearance of communication. That's the number one thing that, that hurts organizations. You thought you said something you didn't. You did say something to a group, but three people heard different things and now there's three different versions and they're not doing it intentionally. Like that game of uh, telephone when you were a kid and you sat in a circle and there was always that one kid that would mess up what you were whispering and you knew who it was and yet somehow he was still like to stay in the group. It's not even that. But when you, like time is a factor. So the more time it takes, the more communication you need. How much effort, is it a sprint or is it a jog, right? Because sometimes people need more motivation when it's a job, you know, if I knew I only had to go like this hard, but for this far, that's different than going this hard, but for this long. And you can't even tell me what you're going to do with that effort once we're done. And you're not, oh, you didn't ask me my opinion on what it was. You just told me you were doing this thing. So the degree of participation you allow in both the design and afterwards, uh, one of the things that I like, I think this was Gary Klein who said it. Um, but I think it's the same individual who did rapid decision-making, rapid prime mm -hmm. decision-making Yes, was, uh, he called it the pre-mortem. So he, uh, and so he highlights several examples of this in, in private industry where they will take uh, a plan that has come together, usually introducing some sort of change and they'll walk that thing through a series of steps, whatever their, their planning process model is, 
to like the ninth hour. And then they'll bring in a group that is a mix of the people that have been working on it and then people that have like almost no knowledge of it. And then they will give them an assignment. And it's always the same. The instructions are always the same. Working independently, we are now 90 days down the road. This change went live tomorrow, 90 days passed, and it has failed, ladies and gentlemen. Like it has failed massively. For the next 20 minutes, write down by yourself, working independently, why it failed. And that's it. And you'd be surprised, and I've seen it play out, that when they are unencumbered by the expectations of, of leaders, because the worst thing we can do is tell somebody what we think. Because as soon as we do that, like boundaries, we've given them boundaries and we might be in the wrong part of the field and they don't get to explore the whole field. So, and that can be really challenging, you know, when you're trying to give somebody work or you're delegating or you an assignment that's a growth opportunity, like you got to give them enough information. They know what's going on, but not so much that it, like it, it frames them and prevents them from thinking outside the box, so to speak. So the whole idea of the pre-mortem is you kill the thing before it starts to save yourself the pain of trying to figure out why it died after it actually does. And he says there's a lot of examples of, of, in the industry where things that, I mean, they'd invested thousands of man hours, millions of dollars, and the company walked away, went, walked away from it because a lot of times it was people that, that were now unencumbered, so to speak, untethered from the expectations of whoever was leading that steering group or somebody random that showed up that had, that wasn't the same thing, wasn't tethered to any of the existing thinking or justifications and just asked a perfectly reasonable question that they were like, oh, I can't believe we didn't think about that. Yeah. And this happens all the time. There's no such perfect plan. There's a lot of value in the planning process, but the boots on the street are the ones that are going to figure it out. So why not give them a voice in the room and the design yeah. of it? Um, and so we've tried to do more of that recently as well, is to like, why wouldn't this work? Again, trying to make things fail before you try to convince yourself they'll succeed. Because our brains are wired to look for threats when it comes to the external environment. But when it's our idea, oh, we can like a little bit of cognitive dissonance here, a little bit of confirmation <laughs> bias. Like mm -hmm. we can sing a story to ourselves that makes us look really, really good. Um, and it's kind of like the, the fable of the emperor's new clothes, right? Where like he's a fool and they know he's a fool. And so some tailor convinces him that he's sold him this high-end wardrobe for a lot of money and it's nothing. There's, there's no clothes. And so he's parading himself around and his long john's naked. And as a kid who's like, he's naked. And previously, no one would dare challenge him. But this child was just enough to say, like, oh, I think the kid's right. Like, and that's how that pre-mortem kind of works to do it. Very so ad adjusting everything for, you know, the timing, the duration, the intensity, all of those things matter. You definitely need some advocates and some ambassadors. And maybe even some, some sponsors. And it, I don't think it necessarily matters what language you use as long as you are identifying like what it is those, those roles are doing. So you need someone with legitimate authority to sponsor the change. You know, there's a lot of change. Like I love how Aaron Field says water boils from the bottom. There's a lot of change, a lot of innovation that comes from the street, from the boots doing the job. And like, we should always welcome that. But there are times, especially with larger change that affects more of the organization, that it needs to come top down. And if nobody actually is sponsoring it, meaning nobody has said, I will be responsible for this thing and the person who oh, I asked to do it, if it's not me, like whoever I delegate, I'm going to support them. I'm going to stay attached to them. It's on us. Like we'll do this together. That's a crucial step that a lot of times you miss. Like you'll find somebody working on something and then you'll find out that they're really, there's three different asks there and the people that like respectively their falls in their shops, they were not even aware that it was being asked. And so like, that's the kind of piece that you need. Um, I think there's definitely a mentoring or, and or a coaching role there as well. Like whoever is leading it, making sure that they have access to support and that sync face, so to speak, to, to talk about things, give bad ideas out loud without fear of being considered an idiot. Um, and then, you know, once that is out there and even before you need other people you need square, square feet, square inches, whatever you want to call it is like, if it's just me, then I'm driving this change like a wedge, like I'm the peak of the wedge. And so I'm putting all the pressure, but if I've got a team of people, we're all moving together on the same page, then it, it's almost like how police close down block parties, yeah. right? They just spread wide and then they move. But one officer trying to push through the crowd is not going to have any kind of effect. Okay. And so those people should be given information. 
like they should be treated with respect and like the organization should really value them and they should feel value in the work that they're being asked to do. And those people are ones that you can bump into and you can get all this information that despite our best efforts, we failed to communicate. And maybe it's somebody, hopefully, that we respect. And so sometimes just their quiet confidence of going, it's not the end of the world, guys. It'll be okay. We don't have all the answers figured out, but I've been around for 20 years. It'll be okay. Like the sun will come up tomorrow. Sometimes even that is just enough to, to get it through there. So picking the right people to represent the message, I think is, is very much important. Um, neuroscience wise, I can tell you, like when you're talking about change, you're, you're talking a lot of disruption in habits and habits are really powerful ways for your brain to reduce the amount of information that it has to process, which is astounding amount, like 11 million bits of information a second. And most of that's on autopilot. It's subconscious and you don't have to think about it. But if you've ever assembled anything from like Ikea or you've ever done something where you were painfully aware every second that you don't like what it is you're doing, then none of that was automatic. None of that was on one autopilot. And that's, a, that's conscious chewing. It uses your blood sugar up. Like you can get a headache from checking emails as much as you can from lifting weights without eating. It's the same. And your brain is very hungry and it, it will take priority uh, over any of that, over the rest of the body. And so when you introduce a change, you break a habit, you force people to think consciously. They don't want to do that. They may not be able to articulate like why it is they don't want to do it, but just the idea is just too much. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I, one of the exercises that I ask people to do is I ask them to pair up and then I want them to uh, practice signing their name, their full name, last and first name, all the way spelled out. It can't be a Nike swoop. It's got to be legible. I need to be able to see the letters. And uh, I have them compete against each other just to make it fun. You know, three times you go, the other person times it and then swap. And you'll see who has the fastest time. And then I tell them, I have heard a common complaint that you guys are too busy. You're too overworked. So as a leader, I wanted to reduce your workload by 50%. Well, the first thing I met with is skepticism. Right, because we have so much language for that, you know, waiting to be able to shoot a drop, like <laughs> you know, it's a catch twenty two. There's just we're all we're wired from the external environment for threat. It's it's just too good to be true, so to speak. Um, but I mean it this way, and I, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to cut your workload in half. Sign your name every other letter. Nice. It's half as many letters should take half as much time. And if I actually made him do it, because there's usually groans, and grunts, and an audible like displeasure. It would obviously be longer. And that's an example of what I'm talking about, how something simple, it's really simple. But if you do it enough and a lot of the stuff we do, whether it's the way we show up at the firehouse in the morning or whether the way we leave, the way we put our gear on the rig, when we put our gear, how we check things out, like we have routines and patterns. And when change comes, a lot of times it can disrupt a lot of those things. So we don't like the feeling that we know it's going to take more energy. We know we're going to forget. And when you've been on after a while and you've had more than one series of change, now you're trying to remember which, which iteration is it that I'm thinking of? Like, and I'm, I'm on one version, the other guy's on another version. And if you don't have references, which sounds cool to say, like you didn't document the change so people can go back and look at what actually changed, which is way more common, unfortunately, than you would think. It can definitely put people on different pages. And that creates interpersonal conflict. It creates inability to hold people accountable, leadership's expectations. It muddies the leader's intent. Um, and if that's not enough, just, just know that as you introduce change, you are literally ripping synapses in your brain apart, just ripping them like you would carpet apart. And then you're forcing them to repetition, which is harder as you get older because your, your brain is not like, it's just not wired for that. You're much more fluid when you're younger. And then somewhere, I want to say it's like your early forties, you start to, uh, your intelligence shifts to something that's called crystallized intelligence, where you get super good at recognizing patterns. Like you've done all these things. Like the young person is the one who can hit, pick the hot stocks as a stock trader. That's fluid intelligence. Like can take all this information in, can figure out like which stock is thing. And then Warren Buffett is the example of crystallized intelligence. Like Warren Buffett can look at a portfolio of stocks. He could also look at a group of stock traders and see the patterns that helps him to understand who's going to be successful and who's not. And those are the people that you want in obviously manager and leadership roles so they can take advantage. But give somebody 20 years of building patterns and then tell them all of a sudden those patterns are no longer relevant. 
what do they do with that information? Like, where do they go? How's that, how's that help or hurt their relationships, including their ability to relate to their work? And a lot of times people, I think, leave this job, technically the most valuable they've ever been. We've invested more training, more time, more benefits, more salary into them, more uniforms, all that stuff. And they leave upset or maybe even not on their own terms because they don't see an organization that they got hired with. They don't see the same people that they got hired with. They don't feel like what they do matters. So just being aware of any of those things, I think is helpful when you're trying to design a change process. But then I think also like you can't ever, like we have 600 people in our organization. You can't ask 600 people their opinion and then honor every one of the comments that they make. It's just like, there is at some point crossover where you have to do what's good for the group. And so when it comes time for that, the easiest thing you can do is, is the same thing that helps your relationships and your recruitment and your retention is keep it relatable. Anchor the change to something that's familiar. You come out of left field, so to speak. It's going to be a lot harder to understand. Like what I'm trying to do right now, like when I'm reading Microsoft PDFs for Power BI programs, I don't, this is not a nozzle manual. Like I don't, it's not the same thing. And so we just have to be gracious. You factor that into your timelines, your support, all those things. And, you know, know, know thy audience. That's the biggest thing. Like if you're going to lead a change effort, like also having conversations and going back to those advocates or those ambassadors, like really conveying the why, why this is needed. And as importantly, why not? Like what happens if we stay in the same? What happens if we do change? And discussing those openly and not getting upset if somebody challenges you about it, just they're asking a question. So even if they ask it in a sarcastic way, use it as an opportunity to educate the rest of the people that are listening and more importantly, watching you model for how to respond and don't take it so personal. Um, so any and all of those things to, to answer your question. Well, that, uh, honestly, that provided Benjamin, that provided me a whole bunch of clarity on, on things I've been thinking about in, in life and change in the fire service. So, uh, yeah, that was a, that was amazing. I'd love to hear your perspective on when you're under stress and how our decisions are impacted, how our relationships are impacted, yeah. how our, you know, when we talk about change, if we're under a lot of stress and burnout or traumatic stress, so some sort of uh, PTSI injury or something like that, we're not going to experience the same inputs as we are if we're healthy. Correct. Any Correct. thoughts there? Yeah, there's, there's a ton um, and hopefully people will hear what their specific aspect is in this answer. And the skinny of it is you can either think strategically or you can react emotionally. That's, that's the first thing, probably the first and foremost thing we need to remember. There are so many times when things are happening that we are just looking at it rationally and we just cannot understand why they're doing the thing they're doing. And what we have to understand is they're not, they're not reacting rationally, they're reacting emotionally. And this work, I think it goes back to the organization. If, if I say, if I'm the type of leader who takes my rank and says, whatever I want to say, regardless of the audience or the message, and I piss people off previously, so they bring that expectation and bias to the new thing, then it's no surprising that they're going to react emotionally, probably negatively towards most of the things I say. Like, and even if I tell them they're getting a pay raise, like the history of the asshole that I've been and how I've treated them, which is what goes back to leadership 3.0. Like people remember 80% of how they felt listening to you and only 20% was said. So this, that feelings piece, that thing matters. So not confusing the fact that when people react a lot of the times, especially if you catch them off guard, it's going to be emotional. And there's a difference between emotions and feelings, which is the next piece of it. Um, so th the way it works is emotions are biologically hardwired, if you will, into your brain. And they are designed to pull you to something stimulus wise. And the default programming is threat. They are designed to get your attention for things that evolution have taught your brain that's been passed along in your DNA will kill you. And the people who got it wrong, they hung around the bush when it was rumbling a little too long to see if it was going to eat me or if I was going to eat it. And then they died. So they're, they're Offspring didn't, you know, have a chance to transmit this stuff. So we have the scaredy cat DNA, basically. And we live in a world that is, has way too much going on. We were not wired to take in this inform much information in these short cycles. Like 
we don't do 24-hour news cycles. And we're always trying to find shortcuts, which is why so many people will just give up and basically allow people to tell them what to think. Like, do me like, and they confuse opinions with news, I think, a lot. And so that obviously hurts our information sharing. And that only promotes more um, polarization in society, which only promotes more threat. So when you're asking me, like, you know, how do I introduce change or how do I lead? Like, that could honestly vary by the second even with the same person, even with the same situation, it could absolutely vary by the same second. Like what happened to me with my wife and my kids before I came into work? How much sleep did I get last night? You know, like you introduced stress, right? And, and stress is the same thing. Like it's designed to prepare you to do something. And it, it has all these chemicals that ready your body for it. But it was, that's all short term. It's not meant for you to carry over and over and over again. Like we know the effects that it can cause um, and, and like a lack of sleep, especially like lack third shift work, right? Overnight work is a known carcinogen according to the world health organization. And just stop and think about that for a sec. Like, and so this is a perfect emotional versus rational discussion. Okay? So where I work, we work 24 hour shifts. It ends up being 10, 24 hour shifts a month. And all the schedules are different. Some people work 48 hours in a row, 72 hours in a row. Some people work 24 hours on and 72 hours off. Then you throw in mandatory overtime, voluntary overtime, cadre assignments, teaching assignments, travel, what, whatever it is. It ends up being a whole lot more than just what it is. And so if I said, hey, you guys, like this overnight thing is killing us. We need to fix this. Like we spent all this money on Prime Event to get all of our you know, carcinogens out of our diesel exhaust. We've got this gear that's supposedly, hopefully not going to off gas and give us cancer. Like we spend all this money on medical screening. This seems like a pretty obvious thing we need to fix, right? And I take that to my membership and I tell them that, hey, half of you are going to have to work nights and half of you are going to work days. And the part of you that work days will be healthier, but then you're going to have to work half the nights because like we can't have them working all the nights because we know it's unhealthy. Nobody's going to want that. Like, and by the way, you're going to have to give up your part-time gigs because a lot of you work on your days off. There's going to be fewer days off. You're going to be working more days of the week to make the same amount of hours. Like that's, that should be a rational argument. This is for you, but the response will be emotional because it's a threat to part-time job, habit, routine, autonomy, schedule, what, like whatever it is. It'll be different for everybody with some overlap. So like that's the part really going back to the brain where like we confuse something we've said with we need to give people time to react emotionally because it can be good or bad and a lot of these emotions uh it depends on what you read there's there's eight primary ones and if you've ever seen the movie inside out from disney okay. uh riley's brain with the five like it was like anger sadness joy disgust and fear i think like like those are it like, but a lot of these are housed with their opposite so you can have joy and you can have sadness. And if you watch that movie, that was the whole climax and the whole point of it was it was okay to be sad at the same time you were happy. And we have language for that. I'm so happy I could cry. We've been saying that for a while, but we try to like we try to rip those things apart and keep them exclusive. And they're not. How do you know good without bad? And you do this on your vacation too, I bet. Like you're gone for seven days, six nights, that second to last night. <laughs> Yeah, you're having, you're having the time of your life, right? <laughs> yeah. You're having the time of your life. And then where does your head go? You start getting sad because you're like, I don't want, like, I'm going to miss this. Like that. And it's like, God, not lead a group of 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 women and men. And then tell me how you know where any of them are at any given moment of any given day before you even get into your own shit, which you better believe we all carry baggage around. And so that's the kind of stuff that like really makes communication difficult. And when you look at what happens with your, your ability to hear like auditory exclusion or see tunnel vision, 93% of the message is nonverbal. Like that's right. Text messages and emails often create more questions than answers. If they're missing so much and in the moment feedback, like that's really important too, to, to be able to get real time feedback and read body language and go, Oh, he seems to be enjoying this. Or it looks like they're, they're reserved and they have questions and not just surrender the timing of your message to whenever they read it, which might be three bourbons in at 2 a.m., but they find out that there's this big change or they didn't get the promotion they wanted or they're getting transferred when they weren't expecting a transfer. And then they react poorly to that. 
they react emotionally. And I go, you know what? I was right not to promote you. You're, you're, you're not ready for this. Like, mm, I don't know about that. Like, I feel like, you know, you need to look at your role and your responsibility in that as well. So you've got your rational thought that happens to your personal cortex. And when they put people under MRIs and they let them watch social situations or read or see, you know, polarized words or ask them questions about politics, religion, they just watch the blood go over in their brain and they can see which parts of the brain light up. And so what they see is when you have the amygdala light up, which is your fight or flight center, then blood actually leaves the prefrontal cortex and basically floods that area. And then as little as three seconds, it starts moving back. And it depends on how strong the pull is. You know, like you get caught up in an active shooter situation. I don't think you're going to sleep that night. That's not going to be a three second thing. But there are plenty of, of things like if I walked into a room, it's dark, I'm hearing some noises. This is not a space I'm familiar with. My wife told me to meet me here. She's late. I'm a little annoyed by that. And all of a sudden the room lights up and it's a surprise. It is, it's a birthday party. All my friends and family are there. Like I'm still going to experience that fear and that surprise. But then within the three seconds, like I probably won't say anything, like, but I'll have this look on my face because we communicate with that. And then I'll say, oh, this is really great. And then I'll spend the rest of the evening leaning into that and it'll be a completely different feeling and feelings are what happen after emotions they're the kind of these subjective labels for and i mean it really is the language we use like why do you feel this way and if you think i can remember like when i was watching 9 11 on the uh tv and, and thinking about like i have family in the pentagon i have uh, my best friends in the coast guard and i'm just like i'm just playing out all these worst case scenarios and it certainly didn't feel good watching it I had been anyone of importance at the time and a, and a reporter had stuck a microphone in my face and they're like, you know, you just watched two planes fly into a building. Tell me what you are, are thinking. Tell me what you're feeling right now. I'd be like, there are no words for how I'm feeling or I don't know. I would like, I would not be able to find the language for that. And the prefrontal cortex is what gives you your language. And so it's not surprising that we have hard times communicating in moments that are high in emotion. And so like we really are surrendering strategy for that reactionary stuff. And again, short term, get out of the way of the bus that's coming at you, duck the thing that's getting ready to hit you in your head. That's, that's perfect. But all that was really designed for physical threats, like the saber tooth tiger. You know, what we're experiencing now have a lot more to do with social threats. And the way your brain works, uh, David Rock, who's a PhD neuroscientist, um, studies this and he has something called the SCARF model. And so there are five social domains that we check for threats to. I believe it's um, three times a second. And it is uh, status, threats to my rank, like the first time your child said no back to you or an employee, like that doesn't feel good, right? And it's, and likewise, you know, your autonomy is one of those two. So status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. And the fairness is a big one, right? That's not fair. That's not fair. Like that, that just drives and lives with emotions and feelings. Um, but so does autonomy. Nobody likes working for a micromanager or no one likes doing a lot of work only to see that their, their, all their suggestions are discarded and it had no effect on anything. Why would I, why would I spend all that time and energy doing that? Um, the certainty piece speaks to our need for habit and routine and automation like and we love like we need certainty so much in our lives that it's the reason we'll watch a movie 10 times even though we know how it ends because we like the way it makes us feel like that's what we're after it's feelings not knowledge not information like maybe we like the line they say there and that's what we, re we like the way we feel and we seek that out um, and then relatedness is in there too, by the way, like that's a fundamental, mm -hmm. like relatedness is, if it's a fundamental aspect of motivation, of intrinsic motivation, and it's one of the reasons, uh, that people stay and leave your, your workforce and, and like, it's everywhere, everywhere. And that's why those relationships piece is, is just so, so important. Like there's very little in psychology that I read that I don't see some reference to a degree of relatedness. I mean, it's just, how do you know if it matters or not? How do you know if you care or not? Like, and it's so fickle too. If, if I'm watching like my child play with another child in the food mall or, or the, like the food court of a mall and, uh, they're misbehaving, both of them, clearly, but I'm just having a parent that doesn't care. 
and a parent walks over and starts parenting their kid, not mine. Maybe I care, maybe I don't. Probably don't, right? But so maybe I'd get a little peer pressure that like, oh, okay, come on, it, come talk to me, kid. Can't do this. But if that parent walks so, over there and says anything to my kid, anything to my kid, and I've already admitted that the kid's wrong, and I'm a crappy parent for not getting in front of this either. But if if they get, even if they see something in their kid first, but if they try to parent my kid, oh boy, <laughs> like so. There's also this degree of relatedness that sets us up for failure too. And I think that's really where passion can be our handicap as much as it can our strength. Because you take these emotions and we know they're complex and we know that they can combine together to form little nuances. Um, some people call them micro emotions, but we'll just call them feelings. So if you combine anger and joy together, you get pride. Like you get a feeling of pride. And if you, if you're like, why would you take pride in something? Like, it makes me happy to do it. And then what happens when somebody doesn't take pride in the thing you take pride in? It upsets me. And that's like, that's the degree. And that's just how subtle the degree between a very strong negative emotion and a very strong positive emotion. They always sit there housed in tension together. And it's almost like the way the wind blows. And so you better believe leaders have the ability to, to have the blades of grass lean a certain way. Like, and we know this in studies too, a third of your organization is actively engaged. It doesn't matter what your industry is. And a, and a third is actively disengaged, like working against you. And you know those folks. And then there's that third, that middle, and those are your blades of grass. They will go whichever way the dominant leadership is. If it's a crappy leader, then they're going to slide into that malfeasance camp. If it's a really good leader, they're going to respond well, and then you'll, you'll pick them up. But I need people to not miss out on the fact that I told you that a third, only a third of your organization is working, is truly working above and beyond trying to make things better. And they are being resisted by an equally sized group. Now, they may not have all the status and rank, but they might. I've worked for some pretty toxic fire chiefs. So like they, they might. And you talk about agenda and ego. Oh, God. Like when, when you have a leader, especially someone who's worked over their, their entire career to get to like what they think is a pinnacle. And they don't see their ideas being respected by the troops. Like some of the things they'll do and say after that, like in retaliation for that, they're reacting emotionally. They're not thinking strategically. You know, like we, we had a guy, we had a fire chief who recorded a podcast. Couldn't see him, but he, you could hear him. Right. And I don't know why he never recorded him visually. He was a good looking enough guy, but I think it had a lot to do with that. I don't think his nonverbals matched what he was mm -hmm. saying. And I don't think he wanted to, like, I, I have heard that it was never the first take. It was always the third or fourth. The first or second was always really, usually pretty negative or angry. Not the message that ended up coming out by the third or fourth. And that's fair enough, right? He had to massage that. But the, the lack of visual on that, when he had the capability, the capability to do it, I think it's very telling because I, I don't think he believed it. And I feel like I can say that reasonably because the last podcast we got for him was about the future and how, what a privilege it was to be our fire chief. And how much he looked forward in the new year to, to being around with us and all the things that we we're going to do together. And meanwhile, he had applied for another job for the last three months and he ended up leaving and ended up getting fired, but he ended up leaving and it was intention to leave. So he was lying to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'm not surprised he hit himself. So anyway, read between that's, the that's lines. a lot. Yeah. Right. But that's, that's a lot. And this one, I just, and that's really what I want people to know is like, you can't tell somebody how to feel. You can't bring them in a room. And have them, and they recognize that there's a form on the table that's a write up, and they can't see what's on it, but they're the only one in the room. And you said, close the door, have a seat when they walked in. You can't say, hey, this is going to be no big deal. You'll get through this. This will be fine. You're a great employee. Like in the moment, that social information is traveling the same pathway as if I had run over their foot. And in that microsecond, that one one thousandth of a second, they feel like they're going to die. It's life or death to them. Our brains have not figured out the difference between that. And we use a lot of language to try to describe that, like, you know, heartache when we are losing someone we love. Um, like, tell me what grief is without also feeling it at the same time you say it. You know, chronically depressed people have pain in their joints. Like, there's so many different. You have anxiety. Where does that come out? You get angry. Where's the color go? Face. 
uh, you get nervous or excited. You got butterflies in your stomach. Like your body is constantly trying to communicate with feelings, yeah. both physical and mental, to try to help you understand what's really going on and what really matters. Now, and those are the moments I think that leaders will feel the tug most of the time in the right direction. And then whether you honor that or not, I think it's the same for your family too. You know, uh, one of the first things I, I wrote about was impact and legacy about how I was messing that all up. Like I'd heard leaders talk about legacy, leave a legacy, leave a legacy at the fire department. And I was working on a project and I think we were rounding into our second year and it was a really, really important leadership project that was going to help a lot of people on a lot of levels. And I was very, very proud to be part of it. And, uh, and one of the co-leaders on it, and it won awards like national awards, state awards. And I know, I know for a fact, I said at one point, they're going to remember me for this. I know for like, and I think I said that not as like a stroke of the ego, but I think I said that because it was 4 a.m. and I hadn't slept in three days. And I was, no matter how driven I was, I was not going to take time from the men and women that I worked with and supervised. So I'd stay with them. And I was at a busy station and then I'd go back in my office or bunk around 1 a.m. And I'd work till 4 or 5 a.m., get a couple hours sleep and drive home after shift change. And I did that for over a year. And I, and I had to have my own little rallying cries. And they're going to remember you for this was one of them. And then I'm in counseling. And I miss, like, I can't remember holding either of my daughters for the first two years of their life. Like, I was so far out of balance. Now, and I started trying to write down how I was feeling and impact versus legacy was what ended up coming up because I thought I was leaving a legacy, which is an inheritance. It's a gift, values, a way to navigate the world. You know, you raise your kids, you hope they go out and they model what you did, but you know that they're going to face some different situations and they got to figure it out for themselves. And hopefully you have a relationship with them that they'll allow you to continue to weigh in on stuff as they've left the nest. That's really where you should be leaving your legacy is at home. Because I started thinking about, I was like, man, we've had 10 fire chiefs. I can't tell you the names of the first seven. I bet you they thought they were leaving a legacy. I can remember about when we put the first ambulance in, like the first ALS ambulance. I mean, which is in the eighties, but I can't tell you the names of people who wrote them. And I guarantee you they were getting their teeth kicked in and they said something probably very similar about people are going to remember us for this. Bullshit. They are not. This place was designed for doors go up, wheels go round. No one, no one is going to care about your family after you leave this place. Like that is your single largest opportunity. Now, I want you to come to work and have impact. Impact is a collision of different ideas and values. I want you to move people. I want you to allow yourself to be moved by people. Like that's that relational, that's that transformational piece of like, go to work and work with people. Don't think they work just for you or that you just work for them. Work with people. Leave a legacy at home, have impact at work. And you will be much more healthy, I think, and I, and I like work balance, if that's such a thing or at least in the pursuit of that, than I ever was. Because it is this, loving this job, going back to that passion thing, has caused me so much pain at night. And I don't think it would matter if it was just job. I, I joke about that too. Like, I'm fortunate that this is what God put me on this verse to do, I think, at least for right now. But if he'd put in my heart making copies and like I wanted to work at FedEx Kinko's, like that was my dream job, I know I'd be the guy. I know I would be the guy one week out of training that would be coming to you as a manager trying to convince you that if we move the color copier three inches to the right, closer to the black and white copier, people would increase their performance in making copies and we would make this amount of profit more per day, per month, per, per year. Just trust me on this. I'd be trying to make change there. I'd try to innovate. And thank God that's not what my, uh, not that there's anything wrong with yes. that, but yeah. that would be yeah. like assembling actually of furniture. And so all, all of this to say like, your feelings and emotions are essential for life. You cannot turn them off. You're wired for threat. Even people, when you have well-rounded relationships, we're still wired for threat, which is why trust is so hard to build, it's so easy to lose. And it's why so many marriages where there's an infidelity end up in divorce, because you have to not just forget that the thing happened, that your trust was violated, but you lose the certainty 
of knowing that that was never in question. And then you have to forget how you felt. And it's tough to forget how you feel. It's really tough to forget how you feel. It's stored in a different part of your brain. Yeah. So I think that's a lot of times, you know, as a parallel, why people, when they work for bad leaders, they remember those moments more. And that's the kind of stuff, like, I almost call it like anaerobic motivation, right? Like it's not, it might be good for a short, short burst or as a rallying cry. But if, if you are doing something to spite someone else, and that is your fundamental drive every day, that's not healthy. Like we know there's lactic acid as a buildup of that anaerobic. Like it wasn't designed to drive your body for long periods of time, just to survive a moment. Yep. And unfortunately there's like, we, because we look for things that threaten us, we tend to notice bad leaders so much more than we do good leaders. And there are so many of them out there and they are dying for somebody to ask them a question. Like this is such a privilege. There's so many people that would do a better job than I'm doing right now on this. They work in my department um, and that I talk to that I ask their advice all the time. And you would be surprised just how much uh, you can gain by validating like people, their thoughts and just showing up and giving them time, even if you don't agree, is a, is a big step in that. So anyway, it's all tied together. Like even oh. thinking strategically, reacting emotionally, it's, it's all, it's all tied together. So just understanding that you're, you're halfway home at that point. Um, and just don't try to tell people what to think. It's an ultimate form of micromanaging. Yes. I'll yeah. do it. Yep. hundred percent. Well, once again, going back to the coaching nuggets that I've, I've got out of coaching is we never provide our answers. We never provide our solutions to the client, to the person we're meeting with. It's always about bringing their ideas to the forefront, right? Making sure that they right. come up with their best solutions, right? So here's a, here's an extension on that too, which I think if you don't already know this, maybe you'll find this interesting. I hope the audience will too. Um, this is the same that's true for negotiation as well, like high stakes crisis negotiation, hostage negotiation type of stuff, whether it's sales or whether like for companies or like people's lives that hang in the balance. And so what's going on right now with Gaza uh, and Palestine for sure is um, when you ask somebody why, why did you make that decision? Why did you do that thing you do? Why do you think you're entitled to this? Like, it can, it's very easy for them to come across as a threat, right? Like you're challenging what I know, what I did. Like it, it lights up a lot of those domains uh, before we even get to them. Like, is it fair for this person to ask me? Like, do I, have to, do I even have to answer this person? Do I have to dignify this with a, with a comment? It's a lot of times, you know, leaders are like, I shouldn't have to answer this. This is not fair to me that they've asked me in front of the group, this kind of thing, right? Um, and so it works the opposite though, when there's a power differential, when you give it away, when you give the why and the why not, uh, there's no negative connotation to that at all. It actually feels very good because people inherently know that it's something that doesn't have to be disclosed. It's, it's almost like a form of intimacy. Like you're giving me your innermost thoughts. Thank you for that. Like, especially if you do it authentically, what is useful in negotiations, especially when there's a disagreement, is to focus on the what and the how. So if somebody comes to you as an unreasonable demand, and you instead of saying, why do you think that? It would be instead phrased as, what would that look like? Give me some details about how your plan would play out. And what you're trying to do there is, is basically, like you just talked about in, in coaching, you, you want them to introduce their own ideas so you can see what knowledge they're working with and how they're relating to things. because. We can all take the same amount of information, but come up with different conclusions That's lies, damn lies and statistics as much as it is politics. Like we read the same news article and, and come away with the same or with different interpretations of that, um, that will, that what and how questions, how would the organization do that? How would this particular section do that? What would be the consequence of this to your coworker, to your boss, to your supervisor, to your other shift, whatever that is, those are all critical thinking questions. And that comes from your prefrontal cortex. So if you have what you think is a difficult conversation and your gut blood slowly starting to try to pull away, and I'm exaggerating, it's, it's much faster than this, but if mm. you can picture the tug of war that the amygdala has with the prefrontal cortex, why questions feed the amygdala when people ask them that? When you do what and how, it feeds the prefrontal cortex. So it literally forces blood back into the, into the brain to help them give better answers. And a lot of the times it's, like, I don't do it to be self-defeating, but it is very much like they, as a lot of times conversations 
start out very passionate and then the energy kind of lets out and I stay in, in the what and the how, what and the how, what and the how. And they go, you know what? It's too complicated. I don't have all the information. I can't figure this out. And you're like, and instead of going, told you so, that's the point where you validate them and go, I appreciate you that you gave this more thought on it. And you're right. It is complex. And, yeah. you know, if you'd like to be involved, I can continue to give you some more information and grow your perspective because I don't have all the answers either. There, that's, that's so much more helpful than that. And I think that's why um, psychologists speaking questions, coaches speaking questions, like you're trying to get an answer from the individual that's not threatening. And if they say it, it might sound stupid, but it's usually not threatening to themselves because they're not going to say it in the first place. We all have varying levels of which we'll solve to disclose and even, even the best of us will kind of pull things tight to our chest. Um, and if you're doing all the talking, you're not doing any, any listening and you're certainly not allowing for any feedback. So like whether it's coaching or whether it's leadership in general, whether it's with my kids, like what and how questions, give the why and why not? Because people appreciate that. They genuinely do. And I think it's needed too for perspective uh, and information and like, and it, I think oh, that piece also informs the what and the how of it. Yeah. It's, um, they call it the arc of the story. And in a movie, you've got the beginning, middle, and end, right? And there's certain things that they expect to unfold. You expect patterns that you expect to unfold, right? And the movies, a lot of the movies that are, are really good, that are fun, are the ones who kind of mess with that, right? So you have the opening scene towards the end of the movie. And then you're, as the movie goes on, you're going back in time and learning a little bit more. And, you know, and there's always somebody that says the answer out loud in the audience because they got there first. And you're like, oh, why didn't I even think of that? You know, like, yeah. like the totally. sixth sense is a good one. If, if you can remember that one, like, oh, Bruce Willis is dead. Like, what? Like, those yeah. are the types of things, like, as much as we love certainty, so like those, those little moments can be there. But anyway, uh, it's just the same thing in leadership, right? Like when you give the why and the why not, it kind of gives the beginning, middle, it gets you to the moment that you are now in. Because whether you think it's the end or not, like if the employee's coming to you and go, this is not going to work, this is going to fail, to them, it feels like the end of the world. But there's not many movies that I'll walk into halfway and sit and stay. Yeah. And I'm not going to enjoy it the same. And if I do sit and stay, the whole time I'm going to be whispering over to somebody next to me, like, what's going on? Why do I care about this scene? Like, who is this person? What does it mean? And like, is it, like you said, context. Yeah. So the why is only a piece of the movie. The why not is, is as important. Because that's what helps frame the boundaries for like, I'm, because a lot of times you'll give the why and they'll, uh, they'll say, but did you not think about this? Yeah. And we thought about that. So give the why not. Just go ahead and give it to them. Give it freely. Give it whatever. Don't, no skin off your back. It'll lead to better conversations. Uh, and it'll, it'll allow for emotions to kind of flush out in a more positive manner. So just th throwing that out there since you talked yeah. about it with coaching. Oh, I love it. Love it. I, I could sit and talk to you for hours, man. It's, uh. It's an honor to uh, chat with you because I, I love everything you're talking about. It's kind of in my wheelhouse as well. So uh, I love how the human body operates, especially under stress. I love how the human body reacts with different people and perceptions. And yeah, it's just, it's a mind boggling field of leadership aspects. For I, sure. So I can't turn it all, which is, is the curse and the gift. I see it everywhere i i go out i watch interactions with people between the clerk and the, the customer i watch it especially when i'm traveling to speak i see at the airports all the time i, I see things it just blows my mind that companies don't change the way that they structure things to promote more relations with the customers especially in a market you know you put out the wrong ad you're going to lose 20 percent of your business which is hundreds of millions of dollars like it's it's a big deal. Um, and so I, I think from my part, like the five years of schooling was rough and obviously having made mistakes in my career was rough, but I'm really enjoying, um, what I'm able to do with my children right now. And I'm, tr I'm trying, like our number one thing right now is teaching our girls 10 and 12 to build, maintain and repair relationships, the how to everything. Everything. And we have our values, thoughtful, loving, kind, compassion right now. But everything is about when you said this to this person, when you did this, this is negative or positive towards that relationship. And then really staying with them in the moment, even when they're pissing me off. Uh, and if girls, you watch this back when you're older, you do piss me off a lot. <laughs> and your mother is staying with them and helping them get through that emotional piece of it. Because I know prefrontal cortex doesn't mature, you know, 23, 24, 25, 26, depending male woman um 
which is why you can't rent a car until you're much older than 16. Because they know statistically you're going to do dumb, impulsive stuff. Because guess where your impulse control lives? And your prefrontal cortex. And so until the thing's done maturing, like why are they going to rent you a car that you're more likely to, to wreck? What does that look like? Um, but the value for me has definitely been like understanding what's going on with them and just being more patient. I feel like I'm like I am building a better legacy with them, and I really will be excited to watch to see the young women they grow up to be. Um, and I think that's what, like, I, you know, want to make sure I slip that in there too. Cause a lot of times we talked about leaving it better than you found it. Like you're leaving this job, you're leaving it to someone. Someone will make the wheels go round. Someone will be under the door when it goes up. And that's okay. Like I would not be upset that my daughter graduated high school because now it makes all of a sudden my accomplishment of graduating high school less than, you know, like. And a lot of times I watch promotions happen and people get upset because they think that who got promoted is now somehow diminished or diluted their role. And it's like, no, that's about them. Like you have your opportunity is still the same for you. You have no less. That has nothing to do with you as much as you think it does. Like it might make your job a little harder have that person associated as a peer. But I, I have confidence that you can overcome that very quickly. In fact, uh, so the same thing is true. You know, like I don't quit on my girls the first time. Or every time they make a mistake, don't quit on people either. You know, lean in and help them grow up. Make sure they eat their vegetables. Make sure you're eating your vegetables, which is the stuff that's not necessarily fun, like leadership development. And then uh, enjoy, like enjoy watching them do the things that you know you used to do, and don't be bitter about it. And I, I deal with ego too. Like I, I have to challenge my own ego when I don't get the same opportunities as everybody else. I'm not perfect in that, but it, it helps me get there quicker. Now that's human, and I think. Like that's probably an important piece to remind people, especially with the coaching aspect. Love it. Cause uh, yeah, that's my goal is to, to bring back the human in the fire service, but organizations, conversations, I think we've kind of lost that human aspect and we don't pay as much attention to the human side of things, right? The human side of business. And that's my goal is to kind of, you know, vulnerability, honesty, authentic, uh, being authentic. Those are all things that I want people to, uh, to think is a good thing and to feel and to, to feel what it's like to be vulnerable. Like, yeah, man, that's a, something else that is. Yeah. Well, a lot of people are scared of it. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, you know, my, my daughter was having a meltdown the other night. And when I say meltdown, I'm like, like we were an hour four of this meltdown. And luckily it was at home. She was just in a bad mood. And. You know, she said, I got problems, daddy. And it's like, okay, what problems can a 10 year old have? 10 year old have. But instead of being condescending, what problems does a 10 year old have? I, I, she probably generally has one that I hadn't thought of. Right. And so she didn't want to talk about it. Okay. It's almost like a game we play. I, I think maybe she's testing to see how much we care, how much patient we are. But regardless, like, you don't want to talk about it. You don't want to talk about it. Um, but now it's bedtime and she doesn't feel any better. And I know she's going to be up all night. So I ask her and that. And everybody's there because we try to do as much as a family as we can to talk about this because I know my oldest watches and sees how we interact. And just like when we're having conversations with my oldest, I know my youngest watches. And so setting that role model example, as long as it's not a private conversation, we'll try to have it together as a family. Uh, it also helps keep my wife and I on the same page and preventing them from pigeoning us against each other, which they do try to do quite a bit. And uh, I said, hey, how many problems are we talking about? And she said, I don't know. And I said, what, like one through five, five through 10, more than 10. And she's like, I don't know, daddy, I haven't thought about it. And I was like, yeah, you have. You've been thinking about it for four hours. I said, this has got you so upset. So clearly, if you've given it that much thought, you should know the details of these problems. So is it more than 10? And she's just like, I mean, I'm like, it's more than 10. All right, let's go with that. I was like, now, are these big problems or these little problems? And she's like, daddy, I don't know. I really haven't thought about it. I'm like, yeah, you have. You've been thinking about it for four hours. You have missed game night. You have missed moments with your family. I was like, so you're in your head. You're thinking about these things. Are they big or small? And she's like, I, I, I don't know. And I was like, okay, let's say it's a little bit of each. Let's say it's, it's some small ones, like there's no ice cream. And let's say it's some big ones. Like, I don't know. What, what, would, be a, what would be a big one? I got, I got poop in my pants. I was like, I don't know what a 10 year old problem is. I was like, let's go with that one. That'd be a pretty big problem for me. I would not enjoy that. And I was like, so 
how much more energy and time and thought are you going to give to this? Because I know they're big and I know some are small. And I know I got a lot. Like, how many, how, we're talking another hour. We're going to stay up all night. And she's like, I don't know. I probably won't sleep tonight. I'm like, okay, so all night. It's like eight o'clock and, and she's going to get up at six or supposed to anyway. And I'm like, so, hey, we've been thinking about this for four hours at least. I know you've thought about it before. And uh, I said, and now we're going to throw another 10 hours at it. I was like, let me ask you something. In just the four hours you've been dealing with this, has any of it gotten better? And she said, nope. And I said, what do you think chances are that you give another 10 hours, any of it's going to get any better? And she says, it's not. I said, why? She's like, because there's nothing I can do about it. And I was like, huh. I was like, so if I gave you something to carry, whether it was little, medium, or big, at some point you're going to get tired of carrying it, right? And I was like, obviously the big thing, probably sooner. But even a little thing or a couple little things, if you, if I held you, had you hold it out and carry it, it would wear you out, wouldn't it? I was like, and what would you do? She said, I'd, I'd set it down. I said, you would lay it down, wouldn't you? And I said, would you pick it back up? He's like, only if you made me. And I was like, well, okay. See, sounds like you're pretty smart here. So you're telling me that if, if something's too heavy to carry, you're going to lay it down and you're not going to pick it back up unless somebody makes you like me. I'm like, can I make you pick it back up? She's like, no, daddy. And I'm like, exactly, honey. If I can't make you do it, then the people that are giving you these problems can't make you do it either. And I was like, and if it wasn't worth carrying it for four hours, it's not worth carrying it for 10 hours. I was like, and you already recognize that worrying about it is not going to do anything. And like, that may not have nothing to do with, with firefighting, but I find that a better understanding of emotions and feelings and what she's really trying to say and what she's not trying to say and the patience to hear her out and not judge her for that kind of stuff. It's the same way I would treat the fire chief, like different language, like different themes, but it's yep. the same. Yep. Make yep. space for his problems. Don't delegitimize her or, or tell him he's wrong to think any of those things. Like if people show them and they show them, they're not wrong. It's their reality. Yeah. may not work when they try to integrate with the larger reality, but you know, the, uh, if the galings exist, that's like just groups for that. You, you'll find some belongings. You'll find some relatedness for that. Um, Parenting and maybe is the best president leadership school, right? Eh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's just understanding that, you know, people view things differently. And mm -hmm. we, are, we can agree to that. But all of a sudden, like when it comes down to like, but there can only be one reality. It's like, well, I don't know. We've already said that we can agree to disagree and we can see things differently and that we value diverse thought. Right. Are you sure? Because like we think differently and now you're telling me it's valuable, but all of a sudden when it confronts your agenda, you don't want that. Like, which is it? And that's, the, I think that's the tension between thinking strategically and reacting emotionally as well. Yeah. Yeah. It feels good to say it might like, feels challenged. We don't like it. Like you say, it wasn't a, a fire story, but I think that relates a hundred percent to us working in the fire station. That's our relationships and how we interact with people. Benjamin, it's been a, a total honor. Uh, to have you on the show, uh, honestly, all, all your nuggets, uh, I'm going to have to watch this a few times to get all the nuggets out of it. Uh, it's going to be a, a pleasure to edit it and uh, get all the clips out there. So, but I'd like to offer you one chance to share a nugget that you just want to make sure this audience hears from you today as a parting piece. Hmm. Let me take a second and think about this. I'd like to think I'd think of something eloquent to say, but I probably we won't. No, I'm trying to think about like what matters most right now and what I have going on. If we hadn't already talked about that legacy versus impact, I think I probably would have snuck one. that in there. Um, and I'm seeing so much more about things like that than 10 years ago when I, eight or nine, 10 years ago when I wrote it. So that's encouraged. Um, because I definitely felt like I was more on islands. But I, I think the biggest thing is uh, I don't think you can ever go wrong investing in your people. Mm. And some are going to give you more return than others. And some are genuinely going to make you feel like you're the problem and that like they despise you for trying. And that's okay because there's value in your attempts and their feedback. And you're not for everybody. And, and that's totally okay. Um, but at the end of the day, like you just don't know what baggage people are carrying around and treating them with kindness, which doesn't mean you let them walk all over you. Like I'm kind to my kids, but I'm still daddy. Like, and there's still a line and I'm going to make sure they know when they're getting close to it, when they're over it. And as I'm pushing them back to the right side of it, 
they're going to associate those feelings and consequences with it so that they can be successful and do the same thing for folks. But don't, it's like you start thinking you've got this figured out and that you're right all the time. It's just like, I think you start failing as a leader, as coach, as a parent, as a friend, like make room for people to show up in your life, personally and professionally. And I think, I think you will generally be happier. Love it. Beautiful. Beautiful way to close. Uh, Benjamin, tell us a little bit about uh, your organization, your um, website, how people get a hold of you, uh, social media, any way that uh, you can connect with whoever's listening to this. Yeah, so um, it's kind of how this came to be. So I'm, I'll be at most of the major conferences next year. Um, and you also have it on the website, which is embraceresistance.com. You can go on there. You can like a podcast like this. I'll post this there. You can read blog articles, magazine articles from fire engineering or firehouse are there. Um, follow it on Facebook where a lot of times I'll just share, you know, 30 second reads, just little things that come across or sometimes they're not even original. I just really like the way it thought people could use to pick me up. So I'll share it there. So, uh, I'd say the website and then the Facebook. They're the, the two big ones. Um, awesome. And if people like this and, and want to bring me in for their department or to try on departments, then just reach out on our website. And I'll be happy to get in contact with you. Yeah, you have two kind of signature workshops, correct? The um, Intoxicated Leadership, and then there's one other one that I haven't partake in yet. Yeah, so the, the one I do the most is Intoxicated Leadership. Um, and then the other one is actually the first one that I taught that has to do with uh, organizational culture. Um, and so sometimes like, it's really become more a la carte these days where yeah, like the intoxicated leadership is anywhere between two to five days, depending on how much an organization wants from it. Like when you get into personal inventories, team building, like it could go any, anyway. The, uh, the full day is probably the most common format because people only have so much attention for certain topics. But at the big conferences, sometimes you're only given an hour. And it's like, what, what, like, what are you talking about for an hour? Because it all feels important to me. And so it's just, it's a different presentation, some similar information, but presentation is different in the time allotted. Um, so like the, the culture pieces, uh, I think I called it where, where we come from. So it's about understanding that like tradition does matter and when is it time to move away from tradition and when is it not? And what is the difference between culture and tradition? Um, and so much of the informal written rules, like baseball is a great example. So many things are happening out on that field that have nothing to do with the rule book. Nothing like visceral things, like bench clearing ejections kinds of things. And that's the same thing that's happening in your organization. So that class is designed to give you a 30,000 foot view of, of what some of those things are. Um, and then hopefully over the next year or two now with the school work done, I'll be able to develop out some more, more programs, but I'm, I'm happy to talk about most things. I'll tell you very quickly when I'm out of my subject matter expertise, oh. um, I'm always hungry to hungry to learn. Got years and years before that happens. I think. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This well, brother, it's been a total honor to uh, chat with you today. Loads of nuggets in this episode. So uh, thanks for taking the time out to share your knowledge and your wisdom. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm um, happy to do a part two if it comes to that. Awesome. Fantastic. All right, everyone. Hope you enjoyed this amazing ex uh, episode with Benjamin Martin. Till next time, stay well. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to Beneath the Helmet. We hope that this podcast has provided you with valuable insights into the world of firefighters' health and wellness. Remember, caring for your physical, mental, and spiritual well-being is crucial to achieving optimal performance. Join us next time on Beneath the Helmet for more inspiring conversations. Until then, stay well. <laughs>